Good morning and welcome to our service. Thank you for joining with us. And we begin with some words from Psalm 100. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So it's with that sense of gratitude to God for his love, for his care and his faithfulness, we come to worship him today. And so we turn to him in prayer. Father, we do thank you that we have this privilege of being able to meet together freely to worship you without fear. And we pray, Lord, that we would really know your presence as we worship today. Just come, Holy Spirit, wherever we are, speak and minister into our lives, reminding us of your love and care and faithfulness. Help us to worship you with our whole being. Help us to live our lives for you and to glorify you in all things. Continue to, to really pour your Spirit out upon us as we worship now. In Jesus' name, amen. And we begin with Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. to praise the Lord together. And as we worship him today, let's confess our sins to him as we join in the confession. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. 
by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then the collect for this fourth Sunday after Trinity. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not the things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our Lord. Amen. And now Leanne is going to read from Mark 5. I'm reading from Mark 5, beginning at verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed round him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt it in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing that that had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha Kuhum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you just for this time together and the, the ability to gather together, whether in person or online. And we pray, Lord, that you would still our hearts this day, focus our minds, help us to see Jesus by your words and by your spirit, to live for him as we go from here. Amen. Last March, whenever we were in Nigeria, we were traveling uh, back to Abuja to fly home and I remember as we navigated the city's traffic we were stopped at a junction and my eyes were taken what I, by what I thought was art at the time, this huge mural along the side of an apartment block. It was a picturesque scene of uh, two families, one on the left hand side looked somewhat unwell and then the one on the right looked joyful, happy and there in the middle was the question, feeling unwell. Uh, 
It wasn't art, but an advertisement. Below that question, feeling unwell, it listed everything you could imagine. Self-confidence, mental health, the worst blood diseases that you could think of. All you needed to heal them was this tablet, phone, whatever the number was. And as I sat there and looked at it, I thought the advertisement, the advertisement standard agency probably would have something to say about that here. But yet, what it asked or what it offered wasn't healing in this case, but hope. Pondered how many people who maybe saw it said impossible, but then thought, what if, as they dreamed of health and restoration, we join Jesus today as he crosses back over the Galilean Sea. He has just been uh, over on the shores in the Gentile lands and there encountered and cast out demons, uh, the demon called Legion in uh, John 5, Mark 5, 16. They have met the authority of the one that, who has authority over all things, the Son of God, and, and begged him to leave, to flee the region, uh, and he abides. And such he travels back. And here we meet him as he returns to the shores. Perhaps the only rest he's had been getting out of the boats. And even as he comes, he's met by the same need. The crowds gather in expectation and demand from him. In this passage today, we have two dramatic scenes combined as this narrative unfolds and challenges us to see Jesus as one who has authority over health or sickness and life and death. And more than that, to see the kingdom of God at work in the world, a kingdom that looks nothing like the world. This new kingdom that impacts not just who we are, but how we live. It shatters social expectations and norms and tears down walls between those who might be considered insiders and the outsiders of the world. Jesus and the disciples are navigating their way and they're met immediately by one named Jairus. He is someone of status, of privilege. And as the crowd are there waiting for him, it's him that we focus in on, the need that he brings. He throws himself at the feet of Jesus, a position of vulnerability and need because he has no other choice, nowhere else to turn to. And we shouldn't lose audacity, the sight of the audacity of this moment. Uh, Jesus has been a thorn in the flesh of the religious leaders. They have clashed already. So for Jairus to seek him out in the middle of the day, uh, under the gaze of the crowd, with eyewitness testimonies abounding, it is no small thing. Here he risks everything, his position, his power, his influence, and perhaps his pride to beg for help from Jesus, who in the eyes of the world is nothing more than an itinerant preacher who somewhat times or somehow performs miracles. It's not an easy position for him to be in, yet it's the one position he comes to. There, bowing before him, recognizing something different in him to try and save the one he loves, his daughter. Jairus is no doubt aware of the risk he's taking, but his position is one of vulnerability and mercy as he seeks help from this great teacher, the one who will heal and can heal all things. So he asks him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. It's a beautiful scene as the father is moved to act by a love for his daughter in a culture and a time when often uh, daughters were, were not held as an esteem as sons. He's willing to risk everything to save her, even if it brings him some form of embarrassment. He doesn't care. Such is his love. He's obviously heard of Jesus, perhaps even seen him in action. And regardless, he knows that Jesus is his daughter's only hope. Jairus is a person in authority derived by his position in the synagogue, his role in the wider community. And yet by his simple being there, he recognizes and displays to us a recognition of a greater authority, Jesus. He bows before him. And 
What does Jesus do in response to that position of vulnerability and sincerity and openness in seeking? He responds. We're simply told, so Jesus went with him. As they move towards the house, he looks upon him and has compassion and acts to meet it. Jairus displays for us something of the way into God's kingdom, that posture of vulnerability, of need, of admitting that we need Jesus to do something for us that we cannot do for himself. We do not live to save ourselves. We come before him and bow in desperation of him. And in Jesus, we see something of the challenge to walk in that compassion, that ministry of the kingdom, to meet and go to where the needs are. Remember somebody once saying to me that the fruit of our ministry often is interruptions, how we handle them. Those are the times when we most show and display Jesus. Those unexpected encounters. Uh, You can sense the urgency of the situation here as Jesus and Jairus and the disciples and the larger crowd move towards his house with the expectation of healing this dying daughter. You can imagine the fear that Jairus must have felt as he hoped against hope that they would make it in time. The last thing he would have wanted is an interruption, someone to take Jesus' attention away from the task at hand. And yet... That's what happens. The narrative seems to slow down. The story shifts focus as our eyes are taken off Jairus to someone unseen. The crowd, large in numbers, pressing into Jesus. You can feel the hustle and the bustle. And that in that crowd, our eyes are brought to another daughter. One unseen as she moves among them. And let's be clear here, her her situation is a desperate one. She might be living, but in the eyes of her culture, she may as well be dead. She has been bleeding uh, for 12 years, making her unclean to enter the temple courts for worship and, and making her unapproachable for social interactions. She was unseen in the eyes of the world, invisible in the crowd as it moved and pressed upon Jesus, and she had hoped that because Jesus was there, she might have found what she was looking for. Even worse than that, she had spent all her money in pursuit of this, seeking to return and to be healed, to be known. And rather than being restored, she had gotten worse at the hands of charlatan healers. A pursuit that left her more vulnerable to the world. She had no security. She had no family that we know of. Jesus was her only hope. And such was her view of herself that unaware of even having the audacity to address him in public, by faith she thinks, if only I touch his clothes, then I would be healed. We have two tales of two people at the opposite ends of the social spectrum meeting Jesus in the same place, in faith and in need doesn't matter who we are, our possessions or our positions. When it comes to Jesus, we all stand equal. We need him. We bring nothing to him. And yet, while Jairus risked shame by approaching Jesus in the middle of the day, such was the woman's shame that she felt unable. But Jesus offers them the same thing. Compassion, mercy and restoration. Such was her faith that she was healed even by a touch and yet her healing wasn't complete just by that physical act. For 12 years, she had been unseen by the world, lacking worth in the eyes of her culture and her context. And yet now Jesus is aware of her presence as he questions, who has touched my clothes? To the dismay and confusion of the disciples in some way, they question, the crowd is pressing into you. Everyone's touching your clothes. What do you mean? But Jesus won't be disturbed in his seeking her out as he looks, as he calls, and he brings her out. It's not enough to have faith and receive from him. Jesus wants to know her and have a relationship with her. 
He completes the healing by bringing her into the eyes of the crowd. No longer unseen, no longer unloved. Now she is known. And he displays the ethic of this new kingdom where the needs of the outcasts are equal to the needs of those who are respected, have power. Our equality is equal before him. We don't bring anything. We simply receive and he will give to all who come to him in faith. And Jesus says to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. It is faith that restores, not what we bring. And Jesus was never going to miss this opportunity of establishing a relationship with someone who has faith in him. You can perhaps feel the urgency or the buzz of the crowd at this time as Jairus seems to slide from our view, as the urgency of his daughter's situation takes second to this interaction with the unwell woman. And yet as soon as Jesus speaks that words of comfort, Jairus receives words of dismay. Your daughter has died. Don't, why bother the teacher anymore? So far removed from the center stage uh, is Jairus in that moment that we have this image of Jesus overhearing the messengers bringing the news. And before Jairus has a chance to excuse himself or to apologize for his disturbance, to go and begin this process of grieving, Jesus speaks peace and direction to him. Do not be afraid. Just believe. J.B. Phillips uh, translates it now. Don't be afraid. Keep going on believing. Continue as you've been. Trust in me in this moment, Jesus says to him. To call to faith regardless of the circumstance because it's not our faith that does the work, but Jesus, the object of our faith. So Jesus, Jairus, and the close circle of Peter, James, and John leave the crowd and move towards the house, met by the hard mourners who are already there and wailing. And to their sight, Jesus questions their reason for being there. The child is only asleep, verse 39. It's not a dismissal of death or the reality of the situation, but a foretelling of what's to come. That all who look to him in faith and know him in faith, that death is not the end, but like a sleep, a temporary thing. In the kingdom of God, the world... In the kingdom of God, the world is different. The ways of the world are different. And so here we see that Jesus exercises his authority over matters of life and death as he enters the house, as he dismisses this insincere crowd who cannot see him for what he is. And there with those who have faith, Jairus, the disciples, her mother, he draws close to Jairus' daughter and whispers those powerful words, Little one, rise up. And as if she was asleep, death leaves her and life is restored. This is the authority of Jesus. That even death answers to him. He is the king that when we look to and trust, have faith in, that there is nothing he cannot handle. In all situations, he's working for his good and his glory. And so we trust him. Little girl, I say to you, get up. As if waking her from asleep. Such is his gentleness and compassion. Such is his mercy and yet such is his power. That all things answer to him. Jesus is the one who has authority over life and death. An echo here of the events to come at Calvary when Jesus would die so that we might live, and yet even in his dying death could not hold him. So today, as we come to him, let's come with the posture of Jairus, vulnerable and open in need of him. And in all situations, let's trust him, whatever we face, that he is leading us down the right road and is working for a greater good through us and in us to build his kingdom. And as we trust him, let's live for him, and mirror out and live out in the power of the Spirit those same movements of compassion so that others too might know him 
and know what it is to live for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks this day that you so loved us that you sent your Son into the world not to condemn it, but to save it. And so, Lord, we pray that we look like the two people we've met today in this story with faith to Jesus, that we trust him above all things and in all things, and that you would renew in us that hope of glory and that call of the kingdom, that as we go out into the world, we would go as Christ went, seeing the unseen, bringing hope to the hopeless, and showing your love through word and deed. Bless us now, O Lord, we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Give us grace, Almighty Father, to address you with all our hearts as well as with our lips. You are everywhere present. From you, no secrets can be hidden. Teach us to fix our thoughts on you reverently and with love, so that our prayers are not in vain, but are acceptable to you now and always, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, today we pray for our troubled world 
and ask for a deep and lasting peace that is not quiet in the face of oppression and injustice. We pray for an inner calm inspired by your peace, which passes all understanding. We remember the persecuted church throughout the world, holding those marginalized in society in prayer, grant them legal advocacy and care for pastors serving in difficult circumstances. Dear Lord, shield all those who take refuge in you and give them grace to face their persecutors, especially during this pandemic. Amen. Lord, today we give thanks to you for the community in which we are part. Firstly, our church community here in St. Patrick and St. Patrick's and our local Banbridge community. We ask you to guide us so we are more aware of our neighbours' needs in these challenging times. And help us, Lord, to find ways in which we may meet those needs, both individually and as a church, so we may love others as we love ourselves, with genuine compassion and kindness. We pray for all those involved in leadership in our church, especially Roderick, our rector, and the ministry team. Bless the work and worship of this church, that it may be a house of prayer, a centre of Christian teaching, a community of service, and a witness of your redeeming love. Pour your spirit upon your church, both here and in our linked diocese, as we, build, as we pray for the building of your kingdom and the spread of the gospel, for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, during this uncertain time, we remember those who are anxious or uncertain. We ask your blessing on all those engaged in the ministry of healing. We also give thanks for the delivery of the COVID vaccination programme and pray for the equal distribution around the world, especially as new variants arise. We remember and give thanks to all those working on the front line, both in hospital and the community, caring for the vulnerable, afflicted and sick in unprecedented times. Give them wisdom, skill and patience and the knowledge that through ministering to the sick, they are furthering your purposes of love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Eternal God, our Comforter, whose Son, Jesus Christ, bore our grace and carried our sorrows, hear us as we pray for those in distress, the hungry and the homeless, the lonely, vulnerable and isolated, those sick in body and mind, especially those known to us and within our parish, who we hold you in the silence of our hearts today. In your goodness and mercy, grant them health of body, soundness of mind and peace of heart. We also remember those bereaved. In your boundless compassion, console those who mourn and give faith to see that this is not the end so that we may all continue until your call when we are reunited with those who have gone before in faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we enter the school holiday period, we thank you for the times of rest and relaxation which are given up to us over the course of our lives. We also remember our young people. We pray you will bless families during the wonderful summer months. Help make homes a place of relaxation joy, love, peace and safety. We also pray for all staff involved in education, that they will take the opportunity to recharge their batteries ready for a new term. Teach us to use our leisure and holidays to rebuild our body and renew our minds. And may we be strengthened and refreshed in the spirit of our daily work and the service of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Lord, as we go from this service today, whether it's online or in person, Strengthen us for service in the world, that the words we have heard, said and sung may find expression in our daily life and work every day. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. And the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the blessing. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. 
And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Then just in terms of announcements, our online services continue each Sunday, available from 10.30. Our kids program online is available from 11.30 each Sunday. And then our in-person services uh, each Sunday at 10 in Holy Trinity, in St. Patrick's Church at 10, in St. Patrick's Church Hall at 10, the all-age service, and then the service in Holy Trinity Church Hall at 11.15. And then uh, the Wednesday morning service at 10.30 in Holy Trinity as well. You'll receive a letter from me, uh, hopefully in the next day or two, so please do read that. There's quite a bit of information about things that are planned over the summer, uh, and there'll be further information on the website as well about various things. But again, thank you for joining with us, and may the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.